our sign out front, uh, in fact, our sign out back too, because uh, there's a sign back here, because at one time uh, it appeared that the main drag heading out of Allen was going to be Main Street, and then McDermott came through, and so we have a sign in both spots, sign out here on McDermott, sign on Main Street, says First Baptist Church. And here's how it came to that creative name. It was the First Baptist Church to be built in Allen. That's that's how the marketing on that worked. It's uh, pretty creative. Uh, it's a Baptist church as opposed to some other denomination or background. And, and it's a church as, po- as opposed to a school or a business or something else. Uh, so that's that creative naming process we do in Baptist world. There's a, there's a town in Virginia that I, I'm aware of and know of, and this is true in many places, especially in the older parts of our country, that there is a Fifth Baptist Church. Which is, you know, at some point you just say, well, you just need to talk to a marketing specialist at some point. That's a terrible. First Baptist, second, third, fourth, and now Fifth Baptist Church. Congratulations. Just call it something else. Call it by a street, do something. Now, that name, First Baptist Church, it tells a few things, but it doesn't tell a lot about our identity. And so today, one of the things I'd like to do is just to create a little more identity with, when you think about First Baptist Church, FBC. I want, to, I want to help us think about us, maybe, in a more strategic way. And, and us, because this is us. And this is how that part works. There's us, and there's them. And that's true everywhere. And, and with your favorite football team, well, there's, there's us, and there's them. And with your business competitors, there's us, and there's them. And in church, there's what is unique about us, and then there's a lot of them out there, and, and there's a difference between them, and so these things will help to, uh, to break that out in a little more detail. Now, I want to talk to you about a couple things here. First, and by the way, this is a lot of the content that is in our uh, membership class, the class that we have where we say that the, uh, the, the version of it where we have a lot more conversation about it uh, is going to come up next Sunday, but... I want to give a lot of this today. It's been a couple of years since we've done this on Sunday morning, and I want to do this on Sunday morning because I want some of you just to be reminded of it. Our church does happen to be a Baptist church. That's what it says on the sign, Baptist church. That doesn't really narrow it down much because there are over 100 different kinds of Baptists just in the United States. So there's a lot of variety when it comes to Baptists here, there, and back again. Some of the, some of the people that say that well, we're a Baptist We'd say, well, that's them, but this is us. It's a, there's a lot of difference between the two uh, in, in all sorts of different ways. We relate to other Christian groups. We relate to some Baptist groups in Collin County, in uh, the state of Texas, and nationally. And we relate to denominational groups. Those are largely Baptist titles. And we relate to them for partnership, for fellowship, for training, for, for other purposes are going to be helpful to us in carrying out the mission God has entrusted to us. So we're, some things we do better together. Some things when we join hands with other people of like-minded faith in ministry mission, we can just do bigger things than we can do right here by ourselves. So we do that denominationally, but in our church, we cross denominational lines all the time. Anyone that they're going to believe the same things we do, have a heart for the same things we have a heart for, We'll cross, we'll cross denominational lines quickly to partner with other people. And there are all kinds of folks and organizations that if they can help us do what we believe God's called us to do, we'll partner. We'll, we'll, we'll join hands with a lot of different folks to help us accomplish our mission. Now, this is us. And these this is us things relate to some core beliefs that make us different from a lot of them. And uh, here's the first part. And by the way, I didn't give you nearly enough blanks to fill out because I'm going to fly through here. Now, if, uh, if you hear something, you say, I don't, I don't know what that means. Or I need to get more of that. You may want to sign up for the membership class, uh, for the first steps class of next Sunday. Some of these things you just need to be reminded of on a regular basis. And so this is us. We believe Jesus has all authority. Jesus said All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And then he gave out the Great Commission. So Jesus has all authority. And what we know of his authority, what we know of what he expects of us, is in his word. So we believe at our church, and this makes us different than a whole lot of places who will even call themselves Christian. We believe the Bible is authoritative. That the Bible was written 
by some folks divinely inspired by God the Holy Spirit. It has God as its author, salvation for its end, and truth without any mixture of error for its matter. So at our place, we teach the Bible that when the Bible speaks, God speaks. This is not a suggestion book. It's not a, it's not a feel-good uh, message from the self-help section, but it's authoritative when it talks to us. And what it says is truth without any mixture of error. And so we're going to be a Bible-based people. There are a lot of folks who say, we believe the parts of the Bible that don't inconvenience us, that don't ask us to do anything. But we, we believe the Bible, when it speaks, God himself speaks. We believe here in the priesthood of believers. And that means that we have direct access to God through relationship to Jesus Christ. You don't have to have me or somebody else as an intermediary besides Jesus himself to have a relationship to God and to be on mission with him. But we believe that that priesthood is a priesthood of believers. That uh, I, there's a lot, I can read my Bible and I can pray and I can understand a lot about the will of God for my life, but there's a lot about God's will I can never know apart from my relationship to other believers because that's how God designed it to be lived. There's no Lone Ranger Christians. We're in this thing together. So we're going to believe in the priesthood of believers, which is privilege, which is awesome, and responsibility, which is awesome. That God has given us responsibility for one another in this world. Now, we believe this is us in the autonomy of the local church. See, we, we associate with others, we work with others, we join hands with others, but this is what makes being a member of this church different than a lot of churches or a lot of denominations you're going to be a part of. Most, most all religious groups have something that looks like that. And at the top of that triangle is some individual or group of individuals, and it bleeds down. Okay, here's the leadership, and then they tell the people at the national level, the national level tells the people at the state level, state level tells the people at the local level, and it, it, it goes down from there. But we believe in the autonomy of the local church. We believe that we, there are things we do better together, absolutely. We partner all the time with other spiritual, other religious groups, other uh, organizations that are going to help us carry out our mission effectively. But we believe we are self-governing and we are independent from denominational control. So here's what happens. We determine our own strategy, our own structure, our own style right here. We, we make those decisions at the local level. We decide. We, we, we send, we, we're partnered. Where a lot of denominations, they'll say, okay, your church is this big with this much money coming in. You need to give us this percentage. With us, in our process of budgeting, we determine right here. This is how much we're going to give to those other organizations. Because we believe this helps us and this is a part of our mission, our ministry right here. So we determine those things at the local level. In our context of how we are organized, the this is us part. We have, uh, we have ministry teams who carry out most of what happens here. And we have a handful of committees. And we just have a handful of committees. And those committees, overwhelmingly, they, what, what they have in common is they have financial responsibilities. So they're elected by the church. And those committees are a part of the decision-making and the accountability part of our church. We do not vote on much as a church. Sometimes small churches vote on everything, from the ply of the toilet paper to what color to paint the walls. We don't, we don't do a whole lot of voting in our church at this stage of things. What we vote on as a church primarily is our annual budget, because that's our ministry plan for the next year. And so we vote on a budget. We, we are in our cycle... We're, we'll be in intensive budget preparation time, January, February, March. We'll vote on the budget in March. And then in April, our new budget year begins. And that's our ministry plan for the year, so we vote on that. If we have big decisions, uh, and we've had decisions before, where we're going to take on any kind of debt, like for buying properties and things. And God's blessed us to be able to buy a lot of property down here in the, as uh, the city makes fun of us in the Central Baptist District. Uh, technically, Central Business District, but Central Baptist District is what they call it with a primary landowner down here. We, we've been able to buy pieces of property and tie this campus together in wonderful ways. My predecessor, Dick Center, had a, really, had a real vision for, for buy, we got to buy property. Gotta buy, and boy, house at a time, square inch at a time, just about. He had a vision for that. And I was able to follow in that, in that pattern and the church is already inclined that way and 
God's blessed us with so, so much uh, down here. So, you know, those kind of things, church votes. Uh, our church has, has a lot of accountability structures built into it. We have a stewardship committee. They meet on a monthly basis. They look at every penny that comes in, every penny that goes out, and th that's on a monthly basis. Then on a every three months basis, there's a church conference. Church conferences, that report is laid out for anybody who wants to come see it. We have one coming up the first uh, first Wednesday of November, and at that one, and you can see it anytime in between, contact Roger Taff, he'd be glad to walk you through the most recent financial statement we go through, and with the church, here's every penny that came in, here's every penny that went out, here's where it was spent, and folks can ask questions about anything and everything. We have an annual church audit where an outside firm comes in, and we've been doing this for years, and so they, they, they are familiar with us, and they always make suggestions because otherwise, you know, they, they think they weren't earning their money and so would we, I guess. So they come in, make, make suggestions to make sure we're doing it, uh, everything above board, accountable, the way it should be done with our church finances. Uh, we have a personnel committee, missions committee, media, missions committee, uh, a building and land committee that help us in those bigger decisions, things that are moving forward in the life of our church. Then we have deacons, deacons called out by the church. The deacons are, then... Uh, come up with a group of deacon, a deacon leadership team, we call them. Our deacons are not a decision-making body in our process, but they're also, they're a big part of our spiritual decision-making. As I look to them as spiritual uh, leaders and giving me input and making sure I'm not missing something I don't want to miss. And so uh, we work together, the deacon leadership team. I meet with them on a monthly basis, and they're my direct accountability and they perform my annual review. The first year I was here, the church wasn't, hadn't been doing annual reviews. I said, I want an annual review from the first year I'm here. And every year, I want to see, here's, here's, here's where I am. Here's where I'm coming up short. It's a pretty long process. I rule out everything we do as a church and where I think we missed it, where I think we hit it, and uh, where, we're, where we're wanting to move next. And, and so that's our structure of uh, accountability and transparency in what we do as a church, this is us. But that's just a piece of us. That's just organization structure. The heart of our church is what God has entrusted to us in his word. And I want to share two passages of scripture, both from Matthew, that break that out. The first is often referred to as the great commandment, and it's in Matthew chapter 22. I want to invite you to open a Bible to Matthew 22. The other one's going to be Matthew 28. Matthew 22, verse 34. In Matthew 22, Jesus is under fire. Every time he turns around, someone's challenging his authority, challenging his teaching, challenging, trying to trap him, really, to, to try to put him out of business. And the great commandment comes in a flow of these personal attacks as he lays down incredible teaching after incredible teaching that backs up his adversaries. In verse 34 of Matthew 22, it says, But when the Pharisees heard that he had been silenced. He had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees and Sadducees. They formed the two uh, most prominent religious groups, power structure in Jewish religion in Jerusalem. They didn't like each other. The Pharisees were all about the rules and regulations. The Sadducees were more about power. And uh, as we try to always keep them separate, one of the big differences between the two is that the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection which Jesus yanks her chain on that several times. And because they do not believe in the resurrection, they are sad, you see. That's how you tell the difference. Now, it says, they approach him, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second's like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Everything law and prophets from the Old Testament is found summarized in this great commandment. And then the second thing, Matthew 28, the great commission. And this is Jesus has died on the cross. He has been raised from the dead. He is now about to ascend back into heaven. 
He's giving final instructions, and this is the last thing he says. That makes it a pretty important thing to remember. Matthew 28, verse 16. Now the eleven disciples, because Judas is no longer in the picture, the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when, he, when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Oh, some were excited, some still not sure. And Jesus said, came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, which is a big deal. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Now, at our church, one way to say this is we believe that a great commitment to the great commandment and the great commission will grow a great church. And it will grow a great Christian. And so these things form a lot of who we are, that this is us, part of us. Now, I said we've been First Baptist Church Allen for 139 years. We are FBC Allen. Some of you uh, shorten that and say it that way. But that really doesn't help us with the identity part of us so much. So I want you to think about it. When you think about it, when someone says, where do you go to church? Say, First Baptist Church Allen, FBC. Well, what's, what's unique about you? Well, I want you to take the F and the B and the C, and that forms our outline today about who we really are, the core of what's important to us as a church family. And this is the first thing. When you think about the F of FBC, I want you to think about it this way. Faith in Jesus Christ. Make it that. Faith in Jesus Christ. What's important to you at that church? Faith in Jesus Christ. And here's some things about that. We believe at our church, this is us. Salvation is by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. It is grace. It means it is freely given to us by God. We don't earn it. We don't deserve it. Uh, we don't do anything to merit this gift. We're saved by grace, and our response is to respond in faith. God reaches out to us in grace. He invites us to respond back in, in, in faith and commit, trust, commitment, surrender, to say, yes, I, I want to have this gift. I accept this gift by faith, believing. Faith, believing Jesus died on the cross for my sins, believing he was raised from the dead, believing he is the God, the Son, and I want to surrender my life to him. I... I, I, I I accept this incredible gift. Salvation by grace through faith in Jesus. Now, again, that gift is unearned and undeserved on our part. Now, that's an important part of this. And that separates out of the people who call themselves Christian. The people who on their sign in front of their building, it says, Church, what I just said, thin that crowd dramatically between the people who are us and the people who are them. Because that is a failing doctrine in, in uh, these United States of America. Uh, here's uh, the second thing. We'll move through some more details on this for sure. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. There's no other way for someone to become a Christian, for someone to have their sin forgiven, someone to know they're going to go to heaven when they die, except through faith in Jesus Christ. So that makes this a big deal. That's not a pride thing. Like, hey, we got it, and they don't. It ought to be a, it ought to be a motivator. That, that means... There are people we know who don't know Jesus. If they don't know Jesus, they're going to spend eternity separated from God in hell unless somebody tells them about Jesus. So this is our motivation for living out that great commission part of who we are as a church. Jesus is not just one of the options. Now, you hear that a lot. Well, I've heard that a lot in the last year in talking to people about Jesus. Well, Jesus is, I believe in Jesus, they'll say. He's my preferred provider for religious services. But he's not the only way. There are lots of ways to heaven. Well, that's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, and our authority is God's word. Jesus says in, this wor in his word, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. There's only one way. There can't be lots and lots of ways. This is really simple. It's like a math. Two plus two cannot equal whatever you want it to. And I know that in our, in our weird postmodern world, a lot of people want to play it that way, that Truth is whatever you want it to be, but truth is truth, and truth is clear, and truth is defined, and Jesus has defined truth completely and most fully. We are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ and Him alone. Now, He gives us an opportunity to decide about that. God offers this forgiveness. He's, it's the only way, but 
But he didn't make us to be robots. He gives us an option. And you can, you can choose to live independent of God in this life, in this world. And you can pay for your own sin. When we take Jesus paid for our sin, you can pay for your own sin. You pay for it by spending eternity separated from God in hell. That's how the Bible talks about paying for your own sin. And that's always an option. But it's not God's heart for you. That's not what God wants for anybody. You know, it sounds so harsh to talk about hell. That's a choice. And poor people are making it uh, all the time. This, this is God's heart for you. He wishes that none should perish, but all should come to repentance. That's his heart. Uh, for God so loved the world, which is a whole lot of lost sinners, that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him would not perish, be separated from God forever, but instead would have eternal life. That's, that's his heart for you. Our relationship to God is not restored by anything we do, but on the basis of what Jesus has done for us. Now, another thing about that, that whole doctrine of salvation thing. We believe we're saved for good works, not by good works. This is a huge divider on the this is us and this is them. We're not saved by our good works. We're saved for good works. A lot of people, will, in fact, uh, there have been two major studies that have come out in 2017 already. Big national, scientific, across generation surveys where people were asked, Christians, people who claim to be Christians, how do you know you're a Christian? How do you know when you die you're going to go to heaven? How do you know your sin's been forgiven? And this is the answer of the majority of the group that call themselves Christians. I believe Jesus died on the cross to pay for my sin, raised from the dead. And I'm a good person. I believe what Jesus did at the cross paid for my sin. And I was baptized, confirmed, uh, jumped through some religious hoops of some kind or another. I do nice things for other people. I give money to charity. It's Jesus plus my effort. Because Jesus can't do it by himself. I have to top off his effort. And that's the overwhelm because we just have a hard time with grace. As much as we need it, we still want to earn a relationship to God and earn our way to heaven. And we're not willing to let go. And as soon as you start adding something to Jesus, you said, I don't believe in the Jesus of the Bible anymore. You can call him Jesus all day long, but he's a different one than this one who said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. This is a big, this is us moment. Now, if you give your life to Jesus, then there's some things that start happening as a result of that. But for some people, they think that the good things that they do, the religious things they do, that that's the root of their forgiveness of sin, relationship to God, and eternal life in heaven. Well, it's not the root, it's the fruit. When, when the root is faith in Christ and Christ alone, then there's fruit that starts showing up. And the fruit are the things you care about and the things you don't care about anymore and the life you live and the choices that you make and, and the things that you do in God's name in the world. All those things are the fruit of a root of faith in Jesus Christ. It's like, uh, I heard this a long time ago, if I say, I have faith that I can get on an airplane and it will take me to San Diego, California, where everything's always lovely. I have faith, and so I climb on the plane, and they close the door, and I buckle up, and I put my tray in its upright position, and my seat back up, and I do all those things I'm supposed to do, and then the plane starts taking off, and as it starts gaining speed down the runway, I just lean forward in my chair, and I, just... and I keep that going all the way to San Diego, except the plane stops in Phoenix to let me off, because <laughs> this is not going to work out, right? Because... I'm, so I have faith in the plane, but I'm going to keep it afloat by flapping my arms. And a lot of people do that in relationship to God. Oh, I believe in Jesus, but I'm going to get there by my effort, by all the things that I do. And you see, there's a difference between those two things. There's a this is us and, and, and there's them. We also believe that our relationship to God is secure in Christ because the Bible teaches it so clearly. Jesus declares it without compromise. Forgiveness of sin, eternal life, a relationship to God, or a, or a free gift of God. Made possible because Jesus died on the cross to pay for our sin and was raised from the dead. He's done all the work. And we're going to struggle with sin, most likely, right? After you made that commitment of your life to Christ. 
And I do daily cleanup in my life of things I need to get right, things I miss, the things I didn't, hadn't even thought about as sin that God reveals to me as I continue reading his word on a daily basis. Places where I had it pretty well figured out and then I've lost some ground somewhere because I was working over here and neglected something over here. I'm asking God to forgive me for things, but, but sin later doesn't negate what Jesus did for me at the cross. I don't undo what Jesus did at the cross. Because my salvation isn't based on what I did. It's based on what he did. If it's based on me, well, it is going to be insecure. If it's based on him, it's solid as a rock. And I don't have to worry about it ever going away. Because nobody undoes what Jesus did for me at the cross. We're secure in Christ. And it was a ton of Bible verses that declare it. So when you think about FBC, start out thinking faith in Christ and what that means. Here's the, here's the second thing. When you think about the letter B, faith in Christ, belong in community. Because that's really our identity. Community has a lot to do with what it means to be a church, what it means to be faithful as a part of God's people in this world. So we believe in a grace-filled community, and we're always working on it, because sometimes we can be pretty graceless to one another and graceless to people around us. We're a grace-filled community. It means I'm going to need a lot of grace. From I need God's grace, and I need other people's grace. And uh, you're going to need it too. Here's what we say. Y you, if you want to make friends and build relationships at our church, you need to be a part of a group of believers. Because that's where you do that. People come through our church and then they, and they go. And sometimes the, the reason they give is, well, I just couldn't make any friends. Well, tell me what group were you a part of? Well, I never tried to be in a group. Never tried to be in a Bible fellowship group or a Bible study group. I, well, did, did you think that that minute uh, welcome time was going to build you a lifelong friend? That, that's not how relationships work. It takes time, and you spend time together, and you go through life together. You learn about what's going on in other people's lives. You're going to have to get into a smaller group than this. Our church is organized around uh, Bible fellowship groups and, and, and ministry groups and a lot of other groups in the life of our church, and we carry out a lot of our spiritual goals through those groups. Groups are where we carry out the one another's of the Bible. There are 50-something different times in the Bible that says one another. Love one another, pray for one another, care for one another, encourage one another. And those one another's, that happens in a group where somebody knows your name and somebody knows your face and somebody notices when you're not around. And here's the thing about that, community. Uh, going through relationships is hard. You know why? Because we're a mess. That's why. I'm a mess and you're a mess and we're a mess together. And we're going to work on stuff together. And sometimes people say, I don't want to be part of a group because it's too hard. I can barely get along with myself, much less anybody else. Well, you're not going to grow spiritually because so much of love, love your neighbor as yourself doesn't happen if you're just by yourself. You're going to have to get outside yourself because a lot of the Christian life is an outside yourself life. It's a relationship going through life with other people. It's not living like a monk in a cave in the desert somewhere. That's not what the Christian life is. It's going through life with other people. And we learn and we grow together. So that's why community is where you're going to connect. Now, in our church, in our context, there's three different on-ramps for community. Think about how do I get engaged with community? How do I get connected to people? There are three on-ramps that we talk about. Here's the first one. Attend a Sunday worship service. And... We do worship different than some places do. We do a multi-generational worship service. That makes us different than some places. Good, bad, or indifferent, but this is us. And here's why we do it. Partly because uh, it's been a pattern for a long time. And now, come to find out, a lot of other people are circling back to it. Because about some prominent churches that have developed around 40 or 50 years ago said, that's no way to do church. You need to send the teenagers this way and the children this way and the adults in here and break it out. And, and there's advantages to that in different ways. However, the churches that follow that model, what we're finding after we have a whole generation and a half of people doing it that way is that that group of young adults doesn't go to church. And the reason they identify in survey work is, well, I've never been a part of a church before. I was a part of a youth ministry. I was a part of a children's ministry, but I've never been a part of a church. 
And they don't know how to be an adult at church because they've never seen adults at church, experienced adults at church. And it's, it's, un, it's unraveled on a whole, lot of, a whole lot of this generation that's before us right now. And we're, we're trying to figure out how do we beat that. Well, for us, we believe that there's a lot of value to, to children seeing their parents worship. And, and that's a dramatic impact. And I know that managing them in a service can be rough, especially those that, the big enough crowd that just starts coming to big church. It's a big adjustment. And, and yet, boy, God starts working in their hearts. It's amazing how much they pick up. We know they're little geniuses and how much they hear, how much they notice. And when they see, when they see parents and grandparents and people their grandparents' age and uh, they see other adults, they see people that they're going to see out in the community worshiping God, the impact of that across generations is powerful. So we do multi-generational worship and we serve together in a multi-generational way and we try to connect generations at every turn. So the worship hour is important because it tries to connect attenders with the overall vision of the church and also to facilitate next steps because a lot of those things don't happen in a class or in a group at the level that they're going to happen in here because I'm just going to push harder than most of most folks are going to get to in a class. There are other functions that are happening in a class that are really beneficial that we can't do in here. So it takes both of those things. This is the place where you get overwhelmingly uh, in our culture. There, there's this pattern in spiritual life that's all about me and Jesus. It's just me and Jesus, me and Jesus, me and Jesus. But overwhelmingly in the Bible, which is our authority... The message is always, we in Jesus. We in Jesus. And you find, you start, I did a study on this last year. How many times it's plural when you think, well, I thought that was a me and Jesus thing, but actually it's a plural. And it's things that, you know, the easiest example, because you, you're familiar with it, is the model prayer in the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus says, Our Father. Pray there this way, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. You look at what Paul writes to the churches he writes to, plural, 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 plural. The church is a community thing. It's not a me and God thing. It's a we and God thing. And so we're missing out on God's real plan for us if we start sidestepping something that he has emphasized uh, so, so big and so often. Hebrews 10, 25, not neglecting to meet together as some, as the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Second on ramp, serve others. One of the greatest growing opportunities you're going to have is to serve the Lord. After you've been a Christian for about five years or so, you can go to Bible study after Bible study after Bible study, but if you're not obeying something God said, if you're not doing something with all the stuff you've learned, you're not going to grow very much. Some of my some of my greatest opportunities for growth, and this, at, this, at this point in the journey for me, some of my greatest opportunities for growth, and some of my greatest opportunities for community have come being shoulder to shoulder with somebody in a mission project, in an international mission trip, and doing ministry together here. When we partner together, and we do something together, and we share God at work together, um, there's a lot of community that's built in that, and also across you're going to do things in your class where probably the people in a Bible fellowship group, they're your demographic for the most part. You start stepping out in service, and you're going, and well, I say, I've got some teenagers over here, and I've got some people older than me, and some people my age, and we're all in this together. And you just start seeing God work in all kinds of ways. The Bible, Bible says, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. And then uh, join a group. And that's where you make friends, that's where you find prayer partners, that's where you uh, do life with other people. In our church, we find that's the place where people stick with the life of the church. We have groups uh, all over. And we have groups on Sunday. We have groups on uh, Wednesday. We, have, we had a group meeting yesterday morning for breakfast. We have several breakfast groups, men's groups, women's groups variety pack of getting together with other people outside the walls of here and really if the only time you're getting together to do anything is on a Sunday morning wrapped around a, a Bible lesson 
and you're not getting together beyond the walls, you're probably not getting to really do life together a lot. So we want to encourage that side of, that side of things. Again, there are a lot of different ways churches do group. For us, we do it on campus primarily because we provide child care and we provide you a room and we provide you with study materials and all that stuff to just make it. We want to, this is one of those, you look at a ladder, and we want to make that first step as, as simple as possible. And if we do it on campus while you're already here, there's a better chance than you coming back later in the week. The churches in our region who do home groups, and again, I'm glad they're, I'm glad they're grouping. But in, uh, as I talk to those pastors, because we're in, this, in circles together regularly, if they can get to 10% of their worship attendance being in a group, they are doing handstands. We're going to have the same number in our groups that we have in our worship service, and sometimes more, because we said grouping is a priority for us. This is us, and this is how we do ministry here. Let each of you not only look out to his own interests, but also to the interest of others. It's not just me and God, it's we and God. Third thing, faith in Christ, belong in community. C, commissioned for God's mission. We are called out to be on mission with God. We believe in great commission living. Jesus declared it. He has all authority, and he declared, I have a mission for you. So in all our activities, all our programs, all our relationships, our ministries, we want to be intentional about getting Jesus in there. And you don't have to ever apologize for getting Jesus into what you're doing at our church. Whatever we're doing, we're going to tell people about Jesus, encourage people in the next step with Christ. So we're going to share. We're going to share with people inside our building. <laughs> certainly, but also people who are near us, people who are our neighbors, the people we work with, the people we go to school with, in all those different circles where we operate in the course of a week, we're going to, that's your mission field. That's where God wants us to be operating. So we're going to, Jesus said, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Well, Jerusalem's just where he was, so yep, share, share with Share with people that they're, they're just going to be maybe at your house. How about that? Share with the people at your house. Share with the people in your neighborhood. People who are like you, people around you, very close to you. You have a lot in common with them. And then share with people who are, you don't already know. But they're in your circle. They're in, they're, you get, they're in your area of interaction. They're your ju, 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 Judea. Then, <coughs> and then Samaria. Samaritans weren't very far away. In fact, they had Samaritans they were interacting with on a daily basis just about. But Samaritans, now you're changing, you're crossing over some kind of divide, a religious divide, a cultural divide, a racial divide. And you're stepping beyond you. Take a step of faith beyond you to care about the, the lostness and the spiritual condition of the people who are around you. And so you're going to do that and then to the ends of the earth. And what do we do? We just tell our story. Here's what Jesus means to me. And we, we share God's love and we care about God's kingdom business. Now we know from survey work, again uh, nationally, that the overwhelming majority of people who name the name of Christ have never shared Jesus with anybody anywhere. Uh, to the tune of around 98% of people who name the name of Christ, Jesus is my Savior, have never shared their faith with anybody anywhere. And a lot of that is because we don't know how. A lot of that's because we've been told it's much more complicated than it is. And so we, we're always working to say, how can we, again, get the rung of the ladder? Where's the first rung of the ladder on that? How can we get into, the, get into that game? How can we get into the conversation? How can we move quickly? God's been doing some good things in that area in the life of our church. The reason we have so many born-again Christians is because people have reduced what it means to be a Christ follower down to I sit in a building, in an air-conditioned building, on a padded pew for an hour, and then maybe I go to class on a padded chair in an air-conditioned room for an hour, and that's what it means to be a faithful fi Christ follower. And no wonder you're a bored-again Christian instead of a born-again, living, going-after-it kind of Christian. Bored again, because the adventure is in the obedience. Adventure is in the faith part of it. And that's what we're challenging folks to do. Just take a step. Go beyond where you have been. Beyond just being an attender to taking the adventures of the faith are in the streets and in your neighborhood and in your workplace 
It's all these people that you're seeing all the time anyway. And they all need to know Jesus. We have conversations about all kinds of things now. You talk about stuff. You talk about, you talk about your favorite team. You talk about your, your hobbies. You talk about your family. You talk about stuff. What if, what if the natural flow of conversation in our context was, we'll talk about those things, but we're always, if Jesus is the most important thing in our life, shouldn't the conversation always drift that way early on? And so, how about if, how about if Jesus and how to know Jesus were just a natural part of who we are as a church? Now, I know that when we talk, start talking about sharing the gospel, a lot of people say it's not my job. Well, you, you just said Jesus is a liar. Because Jesus said it is your job. A lot of people say, well, it's not so much... We like to go, I just like to go deep in the Word. But I've never known anyone who said that who actually went an inch deep. Because you're not going anywhere unless you're being obedient. And you be obedient and you share the gospel because those things are what it means to go with the Lord. When Jesus said, follow me, those are the things he's talking about. Not just accumulating Bible trivia information in your head, but doing something with what, what you're learning. Follow me. And that's where the adventure is. We are commissioned for God's mission. David Platt, the missions leader in our not Baptist world, he says, the goal, is, <laughs> the goal of discipleship is not to disinfect Christians and separate them from the world, but to disciple them and send them back into the world. And we, we've, we're just settled for way too much being a receptacle of information instead of the outward-focused church that's declared over and over and over again in God's Word. What would it be like... To be in a church where the normal expression of our faith is to see ourselves as missionaries in every environment in which we function. Like every, every environment, if it's the workplace environment, if it's a school environment, it's a neighborhood. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing all the time, you saw yourself as a missionary. I'm responsible. I'm, this is my people group. This, these are the folks God has assigned to me to tell about Jesus. And that, that the natural flow of conversation always gets to a spiritual conversation. That's just the, the way it goes. And to be, what would it be like to be a part of a church where there's just a whole lot more church going on and working outside the walls than inside the walls? Church wasn't just coming to a facility at 204 East McDer 201 East McDermott. Uh, it's, it's to go and make disciples and to cross whatever barriers, cultural, racial, economic, religious barriers, and then to take it on to the world beyond that. Now, Everything I just said, last seven minutes or so, I said on January the 8th, where I said, I, I'd, I'd just like to see us be the kind of church that gets outside the walls. I want to see us engaging our community for Christ. And, and at 20 years of being in Allen, I just wanted to see if maybe in my 21st year we could turn it outward a little more than we've been turning it. And, and so we started a journey together, and this is the part that amazes me about, uh, about you guys. I never really would have imagined what 2017's turned into. You know, we have over 500 of our students and adults who, who have gone through training in a simple way to get into a spiritual conversation at multiple layers of what doing it. And it's, people have been really open to it in Collin County. And we've done it, you've used it on mission trips now. It's working all over the world as, as a way to get into a spiritual conversation a simple presentation of the gospel, and then a basic way to share here's how, what it means to be a follower of Jesus, a basic discipleship that anybody can do uh, with another person who's a new believer or maybe somebody who's just never had much opportunity to, to grow as a believer. Over 500 people. A lot more of you have trained in the three circles presentation of sharing the gospel. It's a tool. There are lots of tools for sharing the gospel. This one is coming off as really effective all over the world, and uh, we're finding it all over this area. We've been able to engage, uh, now we're closing in on 15 different churches that have come to us and said, can you tell us how to do this? Can you train our people? Can you train our church? And we have, we have some big churches in the area who've now approached us. Maybe part of our mission is not just, see, we're not trying to build our kingdom here. We're trying to build the kingdom of God, so we're expanding out to other churches 
the focus of what we're doing with the gospel stuff is to share with our circles of influence. My family, my friends, my work associates, my neighbors. But we're practicing on one of the biggest unreached people groups in Collin County, and that's people who live in apartments. Because a lot of people in apartments don't go to church. In fact, somewhere in the 90-something percentile, folks in apartments don't go to church, don't have a relationship with the Lord. So we practice with those guys. So on, we've, we've done our trainings, and we'll go out into apartment complexes in the area. And we have been amazed at the openness to the gospel and the openness to prayer. We've been going out uh, on Wednesdays and Sundays with folks who've been through the training and just knocking on people's doors and saying, hey, I'm Chad, and, you know, this is, this is Keith, and we're just out caring about the community, and is there anything we could pray for you? Uh, so we're in somewhere over a dozen big apartment complexes in, just in Allen doing that. And through that, we're closing on 3,000 people who opened a door to us and said, yeah, here's something you can pray for us. And we prayed for them at the door. This is house 3,000 uh, households. How amazing is that? And then to the tune of several hundred, uh, we were able to transition into sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. Sharing the gospel a lot. And we're seeing people come to Christ every week. And we're seeing people baptized. We're baptizing people in apartment swimming pools. While we're here, let's just move straight on. Uh, we don't have to bring them back here and disinfect them before we go out and tell them about Jesus. We'll, we'll share with them right where they are. And we'll let them take that step of obedience right where they are. And that's, that's just since January. And see, that's, that's the stuff that I can, I can put a, a numerical figure to. That doesn't begin to account for the incredible stories we're hearing on a weekly basis of people who shared with people in their workplace, with their neighbors, with their family, with, with all these other circles of influence that they have, which is the core of what this is about. And that to the tune of, again, just hundreds of gospel shares. And that's some of what God's doing because this is us. And in the middle of all that, we still say, Luke 10, 2, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest that he'll send out laborers to the harvest. Because there's just a whole lot more people who need to know Jesus. You know, the flag we've, fly, we've flown under through this journey of 2017 is no place left. You know, Paul said in uh, Romans 15, 16, well, there's no place left in Asia where they haven't had a chance to hear the gospel, so I'm going somewhere else. And that's our goal. Well, there's no place left in Collin County where folks haven't had the opportunity to hear about Jesus. And we're amazed at how many people. Goodness, we had somebody walk into our building two weeks ago and uh, on a Sunday morning go to our ESL class, which is an advanced ESL class. They're doing from Bible stories from creation to the cross. This guy, his background, he, he wanted to learn English. So what are you studying? Well, they've been going for a whole semester. They're at the cross. And he says, hey, we're studying the Bible. He said, well, tell me about that. What is that? Well, it's a, they, they, they thought well, maybe Google Translate, and they're just missing a vocabulary word. No. He's an adult man, but he's never heard of a Bible, a, a, a story about God speaking to people. He's never heard of anybody named Jesus and a cross and a resurrection, any of that stuff. But he shows up in class at our church on a Sunday morning. And they're doing this story about Jesus. They said, well, that's a, oh, we're out of time. That's as far as we can go this week. And he said, they said, we'd love to have you back. His response was, I want to come back. I want to hear how this story ends. Oh, man, you're going to love how this story ends. This is the story of Jesus. What a world to live in. And God is piling up stories like that for us all the time. And I want to encourage you to be a part of it. When you think about, when you think about First Baptist Church, FBC, I want you to think about faith in Christ. I want you to think about belonging in community. And I want you to think about commission for God's mission. Because this is us. And this is who we want to be. And if God gives us another year before he comes again, or if God gives us another 139 years, this is us.